week we have Dr. Horace and Liz. I uh, may talk about systems thinking. It'll take place in this room from 12 to 1, so if you feel so inclined. And then immediately following um, Dr. Horace's talk, the nurse practice sessions will be held in the same room. Um, there are no more presentation slots left, but we encourage you to attend and hear some of the fun things that are going on. I also have the joy of passing out the comment sheet so we can kind of have these here. So if you would just fill that out, that would be sweet. Um, the real joy, though, is actually getting to um, welcome Dr. Alan Fisk here. So uh, it turns out we actually go back a little ways, um, not super far back. He, um, <laughs> He went to Calvin College, um, then went to U of M to get ma master's degrees. Mm -hmm. um, he then went and taught at Battle or in the Battle Creek School District for four years, I think it was, right. before returning to the University of Michigan to work on his graduate degree. And that's actually when we overlapped just a little bit when I was there. Um, he worked with Dr. Brian Coppola and then got a little bit of an envious dream job that I applied for and didn't get years earlier uh, by going to Cal Poly, where he has the opportunity to teach a general chemistry studio class, which is what he's going to be talking about today. So if we could welcome Dr. Kiss. Thank you. It's great to be at uh, MSU. I appreciate the warm weather. Uh, I was worried when I was coming to Michigan in April, having been born and raised here in the state. Uh, I thought it might be colder than this and uh, it was great to see this thing this phenomena you have here where water falls from the sky I vaguely remember that phenomena but I haven't seen it in a literally four months so uh, I'm in San Luis Obispo uh, which is halfway between Los Angeles and uh, San Francisco it's right on the coast um, and at, I'm at Cal Poly, which is uh, listed as a comprehensive polytechnic institution. Um, the majority of our students are majoring in agriculture, engineering, um, uh, physical science or life sciences, uh, very few humanities majors. It's mostly those, those uh, majors. Um, we became part of the CSU system in the 60s um, and are now um, the, the largest uh, CSU college in, in California, the CSU, or the non-PhD uh, granting institutions in California, the UC system. I had to learn all this lingo when I moved out there. The UC system is our, are the PhD granting institutions. Uh, our department is about 300 chemistry and biochemistry majors, and we've got uh, 30 tenure and tenure track faculty and 11 lectures, and I'm going to be talking about this right at the end because we are hiring. Um, unlike most departments uh, in the world, it seems, these days, we are decreasing our lecturer ranks and increasing our tenure track faculty ranks, and we are trying to do so as, as quickly as possible because we have a large number of people retiring and we're, we're just trying to keep our heads above water. Um, so if you uh, know people who are interested, I'm going to have some information about uh, some hiring opportunities that are going on at the end of my talk. Um, we have three kinds of general chemistry at Cal Poly. We have a one-quarter survey course that's taken, uh, uh, about 130 students take that in ag business, ag education, uh, and business students. We have a 560 uh, student course, uh, which is Chem 124 and 125, that's a two-quarter sequence. And those students are basically all the engineers. And then we have a three-quarter sequence, uh, which is everyone else on campus. Uh, so our majors, biology majors, kinesiology majors, uh, biomedical engineering, physics, animal science, the pre-vets. Uh, uh, so everyone else has taken that course. Um, the, the particular experimental situation I'm going to outline here is, is a little complicated. And so I need to spend a second to make sure you're following along with these numbers and figuring out what exactly I'm talking about. Chem 124 and 125 has been in the studio classrooms for 20 years. So this is where studio started, started 20 years ago just for the engineering majors. I'm not talking about that. Chem 127 and 128 is now in the studio. As of fall of, of 2013, we built a brand new Center for Science and Mathematics. The center was built around four brand new 64 student studio classrooms so that we could move these two more uh, 
of our uh, classes, 127 and 128, into the studio. 129 will follow once we've finished developing the activities for 129 to follow. So what I'm going to be talking about is what happened and what, what did things look like before we moved 127 and 128 into the studio, and then what happened once we moved 127 and 128 into the studio. And I'm going to talk a little bit about 129 because it's part of the sequence. So again, this, this whole studio concept of Cal Poly, at least our version of it, uh, started 20 years ago. And we had this, this studio that was, that was sort of chopped out of a couple old lecture halls and turned into a really nice facility with lots of, of laboratory equipment and, and opportunity for student collaboration. But as, is, as happens on lots of campuses and lots of places, this, this wonderful idea, no assessment of it ever happened. And it, it was, it was great and we spend a lot of time in our campus teaching and there's only so much time sometimes to do assessment of these sorts of programs. So no assessment of studio has happened in those 20 years. So what I'm going to show you is the very first assessment that we have of the studio program. It is uh, frankly the, the low hanging fruit here. These are, these are the first questions we had as we start to move students into the studio. Uh, we have a lot of questions about uh, how, where, where we want to go from here in terms of what sorts of data we want to collect going forward. Um, the data I'm going to present to you also is, is hot off the presses. Our undergraduates were toiling away uh, up until just, just recently at the beginning of the week. So I have probably as many questions about our data as you might have and I, I look forward to your, your insights and questions about the things I'm going to present. What is studio? What, what does studio mean to me? It sounds like a high school uh, essay. Um, what does studio mean to me? I think the easiest way I could talk about what studio is at Cal Poly is, is with a vignette of how studio works in, in, in reality. Uh, last quarter, first day of teaching the kinetics unit. First, uh, first 10 minutes of class is, is me at, a, at an instructor station, it's hard to tell because it's so unimportant in the class. It's very small, right, at the, right, right in this area over here. There's an instructor station. Um, and I'm at the instructor station. I've got a document camera focused on a Petri dish with some blue food dye. And I've got a little pipette of a little bit of bleach. And, and the students are watching. I put that in there. And over uh, about 20 seconds, the bleach gets rid of the food dye. And we talk about that a little bit. What just happened? Oh, the, the dye is gone. Um, okay, well, let's, let's see how long that took. And so they all whip out their iPhones and they put the, you know, they get the, the, the stopwatch on it and we time it. And then, I, and then I say, okay, well, I've got this other bleach over here that's, that's 10 times more dilute than that first bleach. What would you predict would happen when I, when I drop the same amount of bleach with the same amount of dye? What's going to happen? And they most of them assume that it's going to go slower, and it does. I try that, they time it, and they start to get the notion of rate. Just the very first idea of what rate is. And then I say, well, that's great. So we understand that, that something about the amount of reactants and, uh, that we're putting together has something to do with this notion of rate. Let's go ahead and see this work. And then we have about a 20-minute uh, laboratory activity where the students use food dye. They construct a calibration curve using the vernier uh, uh, spectrometers. And they start doing some experiments with food dye and bleach and getting some curves. They get these nice curves. Then we gather this data back together. So all of these computers are networked together. So if one student has a particularly interesting plot, we can show that to all the students. Um, or that, that bit of software magic has already become obsolete because there's this wonderful thing called Google Docs. And so now what our students do is just collect all their data on one massive stu uh, Google Doc. So they crowdsource their data and they analyze it all together as a, as a class of 64. So, so we've got this, this data now. Now we can come back together as a class. That took oh, about half an hour, 45 minutes of my two hour block. We can come back together, talk a little bit about what they found, um, and start to develop the notion that the amount of reactants, of both reactants, the amount of dye and the amount of bleach, both matter in this somehow. So right there, we're starting to develop the notion of a rate law a little bit. 
Then we talk a little bit more about what else might change how fast this goes. And usually somebody will talk about stirring, somebody will talk about temperature. So we go back at it again, then another 20 minutes. And some of them are heating things up on hot plates and some of them are cooling them down with ice baths. And they're getting more curves and they're putting these curves on top of the other curves to see how this curve changes when you heat things up versus the shape of that curve when you cool things down. And they're getting the notion of how temperature is affecting the rate. And we come back together and start to talk about the method of initial rates, how this, this curve means that rates sort of change in over time. Well, we're going to need a way to, to talk about rate that is systematic. And so that sort of brings in the idea of, of the method of initial rates. Now we're about an hour and a half into the class. And now's the time when I can go online, or rather they can go online at the computers in front of them, and they can go to the, the FET simulations that, uh, that they have at uh, the University of Colorado. And there's a wonderful um, FET simulation on kinetics. And they can start to work their way through that. So now they've got some macroscopic observational data. And now we're trying to give them some uh, nanoscopic tools to think about what's going on on the atomic and molecular level. And that'll take pretty much the rest of the time. And at the end, we'll have a little bit of a, a, a wrap up for the day. While that's going on, it sounds like I'm the only one doing any work. Uh, there are two upper level undergraduates walking around that entire time, not just helping with lab like a TA would do, but when students are having small group discussions, when students are working together in anything, when they're working together on the, uh, on, on the data collection, when they're working together on the simulations, these learning assistants are walking around poking, prodding, asking questions, um, and not giving answers. Um, and that's what, that's what a, a, an integrated situation looks like for us at, at Poly. You know, we, you all know the, the research that's been done that says that, that um, having a lecture and lab concurrent helps student, uh, helps student performance. We're just taking that notion to its logical conclusion and doing them in the same room at the same time and then doing other things in the lab as well. We're integrating technology not for the sake of integrating technology just for pretty bells and whistles but integrating technology in the ways that chemists use technology to look things up it's amazing how hard it is in those first couple days of class to get students to look up, use Google. They think it's cheating when you ask, you know, when they want to know the answer to something and like it's out there, go look for it. And they, they get very hesitant about that, but they get very used to it after a while. And so they're using it to look up information. They're using the technology to gather data. They're using the technology to analyze data. They're using technology to do simulations, to do computational chemistry calculations. Again, all the things that chemists do on a regular basis. And all of this is enshrined in brick and mortar in these classes. And there's a major design element that I'm hoping you're noticing, that the students are all facing the single most important learning resource in the classroom, which is their peers. There are a bunch of whiteboards over here, and that is where the instructor station is. But this is not the front of the room. Um, the instructor has these wide aisles to walk around in. And, and I walk seven miles every day I teach my two sections of class because I'm winding around. I mean, I walk elsewhere on campus. There is a Starbucks after all. But, but I do on those days. I've, I've checked my, my, uh, my pedometer on my iPhone and I'm walking around there. The LAs are walking around there. And so the knowledge has suddenly become a little decentralized in the class. And so that's what I mean by studio, that, that uh, the curriculum probably doesn't look that different from most Gen Chem curriculum. We take an atoms first approach. The labs, they're doing titrations with burettes and the same sorts of things that you'd be doing in any other classroom in Gen Chem. So the, the activities don't look that different. It's all about the integration and not being at the mercy of the lab schedule where you might start kinetics this week, 
but the kinetics lab schedule isn't, says kinetics lab isn't until next week. So you've got to go for three lectures without them having any hands-on experience with any sort of kin kinetic phenomenon. Um, so if you're the kind of instructor that wants lab to lead lecture and, and raise questions that you can then talk about in lecture, that, that might not even happen. Or you get that situation where you give your first kinetics lecture on Wednesday, half of your students have already had lab on Tuesday, which is great, Half of them won't have it until Thursday, which is not so great, and now half the class is following with you and half of the class isn't. You don't have that here. This is just in, it's sort of just-in-time lab teaching in a way, where you have uh, hands-on activities anytime you want them. Every lab activity for the entire quarter is already prepped and in those cabinets around the room, and you can use them anytime you want. So that's studio. Uh, I should say, we also wanted, another goal of Studio was to create a space that, that was a laboratory not just for the students but for the instructors. That it's, that it's a laboratory where we can do different sorts of pedagogy. If you want students to get up and dance the periodic table, you could have students get up and dance the periodic table. There's room in there to do that. So we want, we want our faculty to play around a little bit too. Um, these are our students. They're really good students. Uh, uh, very high incoming GPAs, very high incoming SAT and ACTs. This is uh, misleading information. I'm not sure why I even kept it up here other than it seems incomplete uh, to have it because uh, most of our students in, again, we're talking Chem 127, 128, those students are almost all first semester, first uh, quarter college students, uh, but all of our students come in with so much AP credit um, that they come in as sophomores. So um, most, again, that particular 127, 128, 129 sequence is mostly science and math majors. There are a few, th these would be the ag science majors and the pre-vets um, and like biomedical engineering and then pretty much no one else. Everyone else has taken a different section. Collecting a lot of different data from a lot of different sources uh, at a lot of different times here because we're sort of doing it on the fly as these changes are being made. So I'm going to try to, try to work through this uh, as clearly as I can. So uh, traditional uh, for me is, just means our old system of three lectures a week in one lab in the not Adams first more traditional sort of phenomenological based scope and sequence of the course. No learning assistance. So when I say studio, I mean the studio classroom with the new curriculum sequence with learning assistance. So studio, I want just to be clear, when I say studio has an effect, I'm talking about the entire ecology of the changes we've made and not just the pretty room we built. It's not just that, it's everything else that's going on. So in the traditional approach, uh, four instructors uh, who, who were willing to participate in this gave on the very first day of class the uh, California Chemistry Diagnostic Exam, which is an ACS standardized exam, and they all gave the same common final in Chem 127. We have safety incident reports uh, from uh, Chem 127. We have safety incident reports from the traditional uh, Chem 128, and we have also a... Uh, and then there's Chem 129, which is only taught in the traditional form still. And we're giving the Colorado Learning Attitudes About Science survey in that, in that section, and we have safety incident reports from there. Okay, in the studio, we have the same diagnostic and the same common final given by the same four instructors. We're giving the Colorado Learning Attitudes About Science survey. I'll talk more about what that class survey is. Pre and post in 127, pre and post in 128. Um, we also ask uh, students for evaluations at the end of the quarter on studio and on their learning assistance. Faculty evaluations on studio, and then we have safety incident reports. A lot of different kinds of data here. And the goal is, there's so many things going on, we're just trying to triangulate and see what do we learn about students' content knowledge from these diagnostics? What do we learn about their learning attitudes from the class? What do we learn about their, their feelings about the class just from their, in, their evaluations? What do the faculty think about Studio? And when you have 64 students in a classroom do, doing titrations, what happens to safety? which is a huge concern, obvious, a huge and important concern. 
So I want to pause right there because this, this, this data setup is not necessarily what we would have picked had we sat back four years out and planned what we were going to do if we had that kind of time before the studio happened. Didn't happen that way, right? I got hired and a couple years later suddenly we're in studio. Um, so I just want to make sure that, that folks are, are clear on what data we're collecting where, which classes are studio, which class is still not studio. Yeah. What the class is again? Yeah, so it's the Colorado Learning Attitudes About Science survey. And, and I'm going to go into overwhelming detail about what exactly that survey is uh, once we get to that point. And, and we're giving that on the very first and we're giving that on the very first day of class and the first 15 minutes of their final exam. Yeah. I'm just curious, this you know, seems like a great experience for the students. So students who are coming in with AP Chem. Um, you know, they pass that, got mm -hmm. five or whatever, you still... But yeah, they get out of 127. Um, we want their money. Yeah, so... <laughs> well, I think, I mean, it seems like it's a very different experience. Yeah, gotten, yeah, like, yeah, so. yeah. So they, they still at least have to go through 128 and 129. Yeah, and 129, again, though, is, is traditional. So the research question oh. that you're trying to answer is whether these studio labs improve... We're, we're trying to look at what, I, I wouldn't even say, it, it does it improve? That would be great if we found that out, but it is what is the effect of all of these changes we've done versus what we did before? Um, what, it, what is the effect of the studio classroom? What is the effect of the change of curriculum, the inclusion of learning assistance, all those things at once? How does what we do today differ from what we did two years ago? And in terms of student content knowledge, student learning attitudes, their evaluation of the course, safety, and so forth. So you can uh, try to pick apart those? Right. Steps? Yeah. I, hopefully. So the diagnostic allows us in our statistical model to control for incoming student preparation with such, in, again, this is 127, with such a variety of student majors in that course, each of the different colleges they come from, College of Science, Mathematics, College of Engineering, College of Agriculture, all have different admission standards. So they come in with different preparations. So we're attempting to control for where they're coming from, where they're at in preparation with this diagnostic exam given on the first day. And, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about this diagnostic. We also want this diagnostic to play some double duty because eventually we'd like to use this diagnostic to decide which students might receive uh, a, an intervention early on in their first quarter uh, to increase student success. Turns out that the diagnostic score is, is very good at predicting final exam grade with an R of 0.34. Um, and we're controlling here for whether or not the students, because remember this was given to the traditional 127 students as well as the Studio 127 students, so we're controlling for that effect. We're controlling for something I'll call the section effect that I'll explain in a second, and we're controlling for whether or not they're enrolled in supplemental instruction, which I'll also explain for in a second. So we have a number of controls here, statistical controls that play into our model um, that are going to, I hope, help us tease out a little bit about what's going on here in terms of student content knowledge. We also had a sinking suspicion that it might be true that studio, again, broadly defined as all of those new things we're doing, studio might have a, a differential uh, advantage for students who are well prepared, or it might have a differential advantage for students who are poorly prepared. Um, and so we wanted to look at, at not just class averages, but we wanted to look at the different students in the course and see how they may be benefiting from studio. And so we did a cluster analysis. Uh, the cluster analysis, not surprisingly, came up with four clusters that were basically the quartiles of the course. And so we can use this cluster analysis instead of the diagnostic uh, and the advantage uh, as a control and the advantage of doing that is that we can see if there is any differential advantage for some students versus others based on their preparation coming in. Um, so this reduces some, some variability in our model. <coughs> yeah. What's the N of, so this is the 600 person data set, right, from the slide before? Yes. So how many? Yes. Yeah, so this this is this is, sorry. Are the, are the clusters roughly equal? They are roughly 25, 25, 25 percent. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So the end here is the is the 683 students who are in. Uh, again, we have 1,500 students going through, but th this data is from those four instructors, 
right? Okay, so when you look, uh, oh, another thing that we have going on, another variable you have to try to take into account is that students can sign up for something we call supplemental instruction, which is an extra two hour a week uh, problem solving session with an upper level undergraduate. Um, that, not surprisingly, um, predicts about a 4.2% jump in the final exam grade because they're spending two hours a week more doing some chemistry. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's half a letter grade. It's pretty significant uh, in terms of its, its effect on a student grade. Um, there are some biases in this data you have to be aware of. These were not, uh, this is not a randomized group of students who participate in these supplemental workshops. They get to decide whether or not they want to go into supplemental workshops. And interestingly, I, excuse me, would not have predicted this at all. 75% um, of the, the uh, participants in supplemental workshops were in the, in the lower two clusters. Maybe that doesn't surprise. It surprised me. I am of the opinion that any intervention like that is a rich gets richer sort of situation where student motivation determines what, what, what resources students are going to use. And if you add the supplemental instructions, the, pe the people who are going to take advantage of this are the A students because they're the ones motivated to do it in the first place. I'm happy to be shown to be wrong about that. Um, that, that 75% of these participants had low scores on the diagnostic test. But interestingly enough, they signed up for this before they got their score back on the diagnostic exam. So they came in, apparently, uh, understanding as they came in that they, for some reason, wanted to take this, this course. Maybe they felt ill-prepared or whatever. Yes, sir? Is that the <coughs> Missouri supplemental instruction model? It, it, it's cost to say supplemental instruction there. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's sort of a combination, we don't run it in our department, it's sort of a combination of, of that and what they've been doing at Boulder with learning assistance in separate sections. Um, and so, uh, it, it is, it is not, um, it, it is not a situation where every, every student is doing the same workshop you know, and the same sort of things. It's not one of those sorts of situations like um, uh, it, PLTL. It isn't PLTL. Um, it's not nearly as regimented as, as that. It's, and it's not nearly, I shouldn't say regimented, because I mean regimented in a good, it's not, they're not, they're not taking care of the, the instructors and training them in the same way that, that PLTL is. Does the instructor attend the class? No. Although they, uh, uh, well, they can. They don't have to. And I've had some that do and some that don't. Um, they are, they're all supposed to meet with the, with the primary instructor. And that happens, but they don't necessarily attend the class. So we have these four instructors, four instructors who gave this diagnostic and this final exam and the same diagnostic and same final exam for two years in a row. One happened in the traditional version, one happened in the studio. And th these, are, these are the results of the final exam grade based on those four different instructors. And I was uh, a little concerned about presenting this information uh, to my faculty colleagues because it could be inadvertently seen as some sort of instructor effect. That this, this, these instructors are great and this instructor need, needs some help or needs some work. I don't really believe that's true at all. What I believe is this class was at 7 a.m. And all the other classes were, were uh, at least after 9 a.m. What I believe is these three instructors gave a every exam and quiz they gave was multiple choice. This instructor never gave a multiple choice exam until the final exam. So there are all, the point I'm trying to make here with this graph is there are all sorts of things we cannot possibly control. Um, I had two sections of 128 last quarter. One of those sections had two chemistry majors in it. One of those sections had 14 chemistry majors in it. Not surprisingly, the, the uh, grades on the final exam were, significant, were statistically significantly higher in the course with, with uh, 14 chemistry majors in it because we're talking about a section with only 64 students. So a small number of really highly motivated students can really change that section's final, average final exam grade. But 
Controlling for clusters, controlling for supplemental instruction, this is, this is the uh, effect of being in different sections. And you'll notice that this effect is, is 13, almost 14 percent, where the um, supplemental instruction was about 4 percent. So I think what that gives you is a sense of what a real effect we have statistically significant effects here, but what does a real effect look like? Supplemental instruction, I think, it feels like a real effect. It's, it's, half, it's half a letter grade. Um, but the section effect is 13%. Yes, sir? Well, uh, so do you try controlling for other student variables? For example, here at MSU, we see a phenomenon where the students who uh, sign up and, and wind up in the very, very early sections or very, very late sections are often students who have lower grades or they're just not going have their act together when they're signing up for classes. And oops, I guess I ran out of sections and now I'm stuck in the seven to five sections. Right. Uh, the ones who are on financial holes or the yeah. loans didn't come through, et cetera, and they have to. Yeah. We, we did not control for that, right? But you're absolutely right. I mean, in any case, if you controlled for GPA or ACT, I bet you'll smooth a lot of these. I think, uh, well, I'm, I'm not, I, I could control for attendance, right? Because well, I, cause I, 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 happen, I happen to be this guy. This is why I know so much about this. And, and, uh, I, and, and you know, I had, I had four students, I had four students in the class who after the third week never showed up again, right? Or only showed up for the quiz. Where that never, I mean with studio, students get the picture very quickly that you gotta be there every day because something's going on that can't be replicated, right? So, and that never happens. So there are, there are a number of things we need to look at. Now we don't take attendance, so we can't control for attendance, but there are a number of things that we, we and we have the data to do it. We just have not been able to do it yet, which is look at things like GPA. Uh, progress towards degree is the word that we use to describe exactly what you're talking about, because progress towards degree depends on where you get in, stuck in the registration rotation. Yeah. Yep. So, all of these changes we've made into studio, if we control for cluster, if we control for who was in supplemental instruction, if we control for the, the um, diagnostic data, studio versus traditional, about 5% of the final grade can be predicted based on uh, being in studio versus uh, being in the traditional, sit, uh, the traditional setting. Again, we're, we're not saying that it's just because it's studio, it's integrated versus separate. We're not saying that this is an effect of just having the LAs. We're not saying it's an effect of the curriculum. We're saying that this is the ecology of the classroom as it exists today, and this is how students are doing now in terms of content knowledge. There's an interesting section studio interaction, which is that all sections do better in the studio but some sections do some do better in the studio with with a particular instructor now note these are not the same students right this is confounded by time so there's a little variability there there's a little variability here and whether or not that's real right when we're talking about a, an effect range of 5% whether that's even real given that this is there I'm dubious. The statistics tell us that it's that this effect is significant at the 0.04 level, right? So it's just brushing the 0.05 level. Statist again, statistically significant via re versus real. I think are two, sometimes two different things, and so that's where we're at with this. This is this is confounded by time. Um, did this instructor, you know? Whatever was going on, did this instructor have more chemistry majors? These were, all, by the way, all at the same time, so at least, at least time of day is not a confounding variable here. Um, but I just want to present the model again. As I said, th this is all hot off the presses uh, data from our students, and there, there are things about this that I probably have as many questions about as you do. DFW comparison of students getting uh, uh, DF or withdrawing. Um, scat there's too much scatter to tell. It's a, there's a general downward slope if you want to draw, if you can have a computer draw a line through that. And studio happens to be on, the, on that downward slope, but I wouldn't pin my 
Oh, I wouldn't pin anything on this too much. Um, it is nice to see that there is a general downward slope for DFW rate, um, but it, there's so much scatter there, it's hard to say. Okay, so that's content knowledge. What about student evaluations? <coughs> So we asked students uh, the following stem. Compared to a class with separate lecture and laboratory, in the studio, I feel like I have more peer interaction. I feel like it is better, all for, better overall for learning chemistry. I feel like I have more instructor interaction. I solve more problems. I enjoy the course more. I have more concept connection, or I make more connections between concepts. I attend the course but more frequently, I ask more questions, I'm more motivated, I think the course is more rigorous, my instructor spends more time lecturing, uh, I have trouble focusing, and I find the course uncomfortable. Yes? Do most of your students have a context for comparing an integrated lecture laboratory to a Right, yeah, so they don't in chemistry, right, because this is their first, first quarter chemistry class, but almost all of the students in this sequence are all taking biology and all taking physics, um, which have at that point, so we do have some stu studio physics, so some of these students might be in a studio physics as well, but many of them are in a physics class, which is separate la lecture and laboratory, and a separate bio and a biology course, there are no, no studio in biology, so they, I, I think you're right. There's there's no there's no context in terms of chemistry. There's not a direct comparison that they could make in their experience with chemistry, but they they do at least have some other con most of them have other contexts in other classes. And overwhelmingly, very positive um, evaluations from the students. Um, those that are overwhelmingly negative were negatively worded, so we would hope that they would not be uncomfortable in the class. Faculty evaluations. Now, they d certainly the faculty do have context in, in because most of them have taught the traditional uh, uh, Chem 127, 28, and 29 <coughs> sequence for a number of years. We asked them the same question. Uh, compared to teaching this class in a separate lecture and laboratory environment, I believe that the space affects instruction uh, in, in the studio. Space affects instruction. The students interact more. The instructor encourages group work. I enjoy teaching more. Uh, it's better for problem solving. I'm willing to try more new instructional approaches. I have more interaction with my students. I have better attendance. I believe this is better overall for learning chemistry. I think it's better overall for connecting concepts. I have a heavier workload. Students ask more questions. This is better for underrepresented groups in my classroom. Uh, just more academically rigorous and then the negatively phrased ones. I think this is more uncomfortable for students. I think this is more tr that they, students have more trouble focusing, more that I spend more time on lecture or that this is uncomfortable. And so again, overwhelmingly the, the instructors are